Morning, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the start of the Six Nations as much as we all did. We are all back on English soil, but due to the train strikes, I'm actually sat here in an empty studio, looking up at a screen where I have one Charlie Morgan. Hi, Charlie. Hello, Colsey. And I've got one Charles Richardson. Hello, Charles. Hello. And they're joining myself, Ben Coles, to recap all the action from the opening round of the Six Nations. Where were you, gents? If I start with Charles, actually, where were you, Charles, this weekend? I was in I was in glorious Marseille on Friday night, you know, catching some rays, 60 degrees. It didn't feel particularly Six Nations here, I must say. It was. It's not what we're used to in the Six Nations. No gloves, no scarf, um, no Guinness. It was. It was all. It all. It was all very Provencal. Sounds horrendous, actually, with the uh, mm. with the lack of Guinness. Did Marseille deliver on the atmosphere that we we picked it up a bit last week? Didn't we? Was it as good as you hoped it would be? Yeah. Mm. Ish, yes, until, as we will come on to, the red card and the way that the game panned out meant that it it didn't necessarily whip up the French crowd into a frenzy. Mm. Charlie, where were you? I was in Rome, which was decidedly, yeah, like, to follow on from Charles's point, it felt like a super Saturday in mid-March. It was gorgeous, cloudless, and I ticked off the bruschetta tiramisu and popped a game of rugby in right at the end. It was brilliant. I'm glad you two have picked up the the weather because Cardiff was absolutely atrocious, <laughs> and I, and I've never been happier than when I I walked about 20 minutes from where I parked my car to the ground, and I got there and my coat was was sopping, my glasses didn't have a spare sort of bit that wasn't covered in a raindrop. It was awful. So well done to everybody for agreeing that they should shut the roof. So that that's good. We we covered all three bases then. So we were all particularly well informed to chat about our respective games. So if we just before we dive into talking about how England got on in Rome, I just wondered if you had a sort of favourite moment from the weekend that sort of stuck with you as you review how the last few days went. Charlie, if I start with you, what what sort of leaps out? It's Italy's second try. We'll we'll get into kind of what a a cluster of errors it was from England and, and sort of informal, informal, unfamiliarity with that defensive system that they've got. But the way Italy took it, uh, gorgeous. Thomas Allen finishing it off, but a lovely wrap between um, Paolo Galbisi and Brex in, in midfield just to, just to make England look totally clueless. And that was where the the atmosphere was at its kind of at it at its kind of peak, and it kind of it kind of got more subdued from there. But that was just a brilliant moment. Charles, how about you? Uh, well, I was going to say the same thing. So on the spot, I've thought of uh, a secondary one, which was has got to be that that phenomenal Welsh second half resurgence, hasn't it? I know. I mean, it's a bit more. There's a lot of moments there, but I think just if if you think back to the weekend that was, what will what will stand the test of time is is okay. Wales won the game, but sorry, lost the game, but um, they didn't win the game, and but it felt at the end as if bizarrely they had. There was almost an element of. Scotland would are disappointed for banishing a 22-year hoodoo. So that entire crazy second half would be my, my, my moment. Of the I was going to say that's an acceptable slip-up because it did feel like it was an opposite situation. It felt like Wales had, had yeah. won and Scotland had lost. Um, also from that game for me was um, almost a surreal moment where it was chaos on the pitch and I suddenly looked up at the big screen and they had a shot of Willem Dafoe, the actor, just sat there in a box watching the game, sort of being broadcast on the whole ground and of all the people I expected to see on the on the big screen during that second half, it, he was not one of them. So that was very do know, strange. Do you know the link? Absolutely no idea. As in nothing, nothing's kind of leaked out afterwards, no indication from any camp about why he was there, but it was, uh, yeah, it was quite a... Oh, I, can, I can come in with a secondary one, actually, okay. which, uh, given more time. Pasolo Twalangi debut, slightly mm. not at the top of the list of priorities, but it was just nice to see him get on after all the chat. And he looked really good, if a little unfit, but when he was in and around the ball, he looked really special. And obviously Manu, Manu there in attendance watching, which was which was, which was was sweet. I've, I've Growing up, I've played against two two laggies, um, and I'm really glad I'll never, ever, ever have to get near him. Uh, yeah. what, he looked huge, didn't he? It sounds really basic. He just looked so much bigger than the, so many other players on the field. It, just from sheer kind of stature, it was, it was remarkable. Um, who, who put that body? Who somebody? Somebody sort of roadblocked him off the first. The first, they sent him off the top of a line out, didn't they? Somebody, and so it was yes. a really good tackle. But was it Crowley? It looked terrifying. It might have been. 
yeah, it was a speed hump, sort of just lie there and just hope and pray. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes that's the best way. Um, yeah. Well, listen, lots to talk about from those games. Let's start with how England got on with Rome. They won, which is a positive, but a few sort of things to address, I think. Okay, Charlie, it's the first game of a new cycle, so I know people might uh, occasionally be a little bit impatient with England, but I think you sort of have to accept that, you know, there's new systems bedding in, it's going to take a bit of time. Was that sort of how you felt afterwards, and did you feel more positive or negative about what you saw? I I was on the positive side, even sort of compared to the people around me at at half-time, you sort of have a conflab, don't you, with the people you're sit, sitting near to, and everybody was a little bit more negative than than I was. I just I went into it thinking, right, it's clearly there's clearly going to be not only new systems here in a new defensive system and a new outlook and on the way they attack, but also you factor in also the new faces, five five debutants in the in the twenty three, and then also the the sort of late disruption that they've had over the course of this two week preparation which is which is short anyway um in key positions so alex mitchell we thought we thought wasn't gonna um play because of a, an infection he had on his in his leg but he was a late he's sort of passed the late fitness test and, and was fit um but yeah all so all things considered considering also the cohesion of italy and how settled they look uh, both as both in terms of personnel and the way they were gonna play um yeah i, I was impressed actually there were a lot of questions from readers, sort of, I mean, it's very early to be wondering about whether these systems are going to work for England. And and so I really would try and encourage everyone not to rush to too many judgments too quickly. But, but a lot of people just asking a, a fairly, I guess, a fair enough question. Do they have the personnel to carry out this defensive system that Felix Jones wants to play where it's significantly more aggressive than perhaps England have been used to in recent years? I think it's a compromise. And I think it's a compromise, as we said from the beginning, of, of keeping those experienced players in and then maybe blooding others who are more suited to it. So, for example, I've been com- I've been convinced from the minute that Steve Borthwick mentioned um, Manny Faye Wabasso in early January that he was more attractive a prospect because he suited what Felix Jones wanted and he was playing that way for Exeter and um, so you have that that's one one side and then you want obviously um, the experience and how well Elliot Daly suits he might not suit the system as well but he offers experience he offers that left left boot on the left wing um, look at somewhere else like so a theory I'd, uh, just just kind of thinking out loud here when when I saw that question was it's being, it was quite conspicuous, wasn't it, that Rafi Quirk was named as a player who was um, who was sort of going to join the join the uh, squad despite not being fit. Who's he learnt from in, at Sales? Uh, he's sort of faf de clerk mark two, isn't he? Really kind of a small but super committed, super tenacious defender who will be able to play that role of um, pushing up and being that kind of spy out of the de- defensive line. So I think it's going to be a compromise. But over, I think what we'll see over the four years and again and the compromise is that they want experience to kind of win those games and keep momentum over the four years but the journey towards the journey of four years is going to be getting a team that is suited to to individual roles within these systems and and even without even without sort of bringing in new personnel i think there is an argument that that, that they can do it anyway that that south africa semi-final loss was probably england's you know best defensive performance of the past well god knows how many years um, it was tenacious, it was aggressive, and it was everything that Steve Borthwick and Felix Jones want you know, want, want England to be without the ball. But now they have Felix Jones in, in their camp and they've got sort of more time to embed this, this structure and they've got more expertise too. And I think they proved that the foundations are there, the building blocks are there. Um, I think, you know, George Martin coming back in when fit, depending on how long he can stay fit, is going to be big for them in that regard um, because his, you know, his defence is his, is his super strength, really. And him coming back in will just continue this this building. They got, they got a couple of bits wrong in the first half and it exposed them and Italy are good enough to exploit it. But in the second half, when they sort of ironed out those creases, they defended excellently. I had two thoughts on it, which was firstly that obviously it's a... Uh... 
it might take a little while and, and there might be a few glaring errors defensively from England, but it is a system that works because it has been the backbone of two Rugby World Cup wins, so that so stick with it. And the other one was, was Tommy Freeman's quotes afterwards where he was sort of saying how for a player like him coming from Northampton's defensive system, obviously he was adapting to it a little bit more in England had only had... I think they said three training sessions really working on it in Spain, um, sort of as a group. So he was sort of suggesting for a player like him, it will take time. Whereas for players like Exeter, as Charlie's talked about with Faye Weboso, they're used to kind of playing that aggressive blitzer out of the line to to pressure people. And so I think it's just going to take a little bit of time. Speaking of Tommy Freeman, very impressive. Helped create Elliot Daly's try. Charlie, he kind of had a roaming a roaming role, didn't he? And actually that helped create the extra man for Daly's try in, in the back line. What did you make of how he played? Really impressive. He, it's funny, isn't it? Because there's this bridge between, the still this bridge uh, between the Jones and Borthwick eras and, and Jones brought him in um, and then sort of dropped him like a stone after that. Well, no, he didn't, sorry. He he, he brought him in, played in two games in in, tes, in, um, in the test series in, in Australia and he looked really good. And then he was injured for the start of the next autumn and then played and was um, y- yanked at half-time in what turned out to be Jones's final game. So he's come back after that. That was his first test appearance after that, and he looked so assured, and he looked like that time away has really helped him. Um, looks a bit bigger, if we want to plug that. Um, North- Peters on Northampton's bl- bulk up again. Um, but I he haven't heard about actually, that. Tell us. <laughs> actually, it's, that's really, it's really interesting that you flag his quotes on the defence. I actually thought he looked really comfortable in that in that system is maybe that the, the system is quite um it's quite a quite a advantage to be quite a small nimble winger in that system because you can change direction and you can sort of push off if the ball's gone beyond you um look at someone like colby and, and Kurt lorenzo they really um and that is so that agility is really important but Freeman is is kind of deceptively agile, um, as you saw from when he not only cut the line off Freddie Stewart to, to make the initial break, but then also went on that outside arc to, to free his arm to feed Daly for, for the offload. So, yeah, I was I was really impressed, but really impressed by Freeman. Sorry, but and then again, it was kind of inevitable given how well he'd gone for Saints too. Charles, so just on um, Ethan Roots, that's a very good debut, isn't it? If you come away with a nice player of the match medal and you you know you're winning plaudits and getting nine out of tens in player ratings like he seemed to be, what what was great about him? Well, he just he just gave England something that they've been missing and that it, it you know they they still continue to sort of lack it really. But he was certainly he certainly made an impact in terms of the ball carrying states and we've been we've you know we've lamented the lack of English ball carriers on this podcast frequently and we've you know it, it's telling that the that at number eight at the minute and England's best player in the World Cup is basically a, an open side flanker who has been repurposed into a number eight and ball carrying in the tight not necessarily one of his strengths with Alice Genge missing as well it looked all a bit sort of bit bleak on that front um, but Will Stewart stepped up the two second rows were outstanding Ethan Roots was excellent in that regard um, a, a very very solid debut I actually sort of would, would have lent more towards Tommy Freeman or Maro Otoje as man of the match but I no arguments with with um, with Roots at all and I don't think many people were expecting that necessarily his form has been good for Exeter but I don't necessarily think that we were expecting him to have that impact on Test Rugby so quickly maybe Charlie would disagree maybe he had it had it sort of sort of predicted all along No I would I wouldn't say I would I think I think he suited as a, as a foil for Earl as, as you've kind of touched on there as a fall for Earl I think he that really worked because he's that big popping blind side that England don't really have I was really in, interested to see how quickly England brought him to brought him into the game he took the first line out didn't he and he was really prominent in that regard taking pressure off Chesham and Chesham and Otoji as that third jumper he was a more natural third jumper yeah. than other options that have that have been there and that allows Underhill and Earl to be sort of picked together too doesn't it so yeah. I, I didn't feel like he'd I was surprised. Was I surprised? I was. I was surprised maybe by just how influential he was, but that's a credit to sort of his personality as much as anything. But I was expecting him to be in the mix just because of how nice a fall he would have been for other guys around. And Steve Borthwick telegra- telegraphed his selection by picking him up so much as well. Yeah, I mean, I, we knew he was a line out option, didn't we, going into this? But I, I was also sort of taken aback by how regularly he was used and, and, and sort of the, how much he was a source of good ball he was on that front, especially with 
um, Marrow and Chesham, who are both so adept in the air. I was, I was surprised too. It's quite satisfying when a player on debut performs um, so seamlessly like that. And we were getting whispers a few weeks back, weren't we, that he might be the, the solution at six when we were trying to work out how England would shape up in the back row. He was clearly a success. I, I, part of me just wondered how this conversation would be going because we all seemed quite positive how it would be going if England had lost. And I think that's a credit to how well Italy played. I know that late try kind of made the scoreboard look a bit tighter than than it was. Charlie, we kind of I'm a bit bored of sort of getting excited about Italy and being hopeful and and would like to see them actually string a few wins together. But did you see enough from them? in this first game under Gonzalo Casada to, to feel positive about the direction they're heading in? I did, but I didn't agree with Jamie George saying that he wouldn't be surprised if they lost, if they won two games this tournament. I would be surprised still if they won two games this tournament. And if you look at it, what they, they'd be targeting Scotland, the home game against Scotland and then going to Wales. It's still going to be, it's still going to be a big kind of effort to do that. And they've traditionally started well, when that cohesion of that big Benetton um, contingent helps them, yeah, it's going to be going to be really interesting. You still feel as though they they'll be really disappointed, I think, with that second half because they they were subdued by a kind of an unfamiliar England defence, weren't they? Having having cut them apart a couple of times in the first in the first half, they didn't really they'll feel like they didn't fire enough shots. Um, well enough in that in that second half they'll be fr- they'll be frustrated. Well, and also arguably they should have been further ahead at half time. You know they 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 were they were the better side in the first half. I don't think many people would sort of disagree with that. Um, but then they only they ended up in, going into that interval only three points ahead. And you look at it and you're going, okay, that's one of the best halves that Italy have had for a while because they really struggled at the World Cup. Um, and yet they're only leading by three at home against a New England side who are always going to have a few teething problems and we're only going to get better. Um, And so, yeah, they were stifled in the second half, but I did think England have been sort of craftily, craftily good at at, at building, at cutting this deficit and and reducing the sort of scoreboard pressure on them. And in terms of just thinking about England and looking ahead, if they're going to make any changes for the Wales game... Would Ellis Genge potentially come back? Would he start or would they stick with Joe Marler starting? How did that kind of look in terms of that front row, Charles? And, and, and could you see are there any other changes that could potentially be made? It's, it's a tricky one because I think, obviously, Ellis Genge is part of the leadership group and vice-captain and clearly highly rated by by Steve Borthwick. But would if you start Ellis Genge, does that mean that Dan Cole has to start at tight head? Would you want Marla and Cole coming off the bench together, knowing what we know about their sort of, you know, they're excellent in the tight, and but are there going to be when when sort of teams are looking to be a little bit more expansive? Are as there is a like sort of a slight lack of mobility? And apologies to the two of them for for suggesting this, but you know they are aging props. Really, is is a slight with both of them on the field? Are England a little bit? sort of vulnerable defensively there, perhaps. So is it a case of if Genge comes back in, you have to start Cole and then you bring Marler and Stewart on together? Perhaps, I mean, I think that in terms of the balance of the tight heads, there's there's an argument whereby Cole should start and play 50 minutes and Stewart should come off the bench anyway. So potentially he might look at that um, starting Genge. In terms of other changes, um, did, did Dingwall do enough? At 12, I mean, there aren't that many other options for next week, we don't think. Martin's going back in for rehab, so that suggests that he's not going to be fit. It wouldn't surprise me if if he if he kept it unchanged, maybe with Genj, Genj and Cole, maybe swapping the props and then keeping it basically as you were. Did Underhill do enough at seven? There's a, there's a sort of, there's a, there's a conversation there, I think. There could be a rejig. I mean, Ben Earl could move back to... Back to seven. If Martin was fit, they could use one of Chesham or uh, or a Toje at six and have Roots at eight. You know, there's there's options there, but I think I think the changes will be minimal. Yeah, I wonder if they just stick with the same side for the first two games, get to the Fallow week, then kind of reevaluate and, and consider what they want to do for Scotland. Charlie, just on Marcus Smith's injury, is there any sort of update from from post match about when he might be back? Uh, he won't. He, he's. Being taken out of the squad um, for this week, so he won't he won't be around. I don't think he's been definitively ru- ruled out of the tournament yet. So they'll be as sort of hinting at 
following on there, sorry from what Charles is saying, I think England can take it. And now they've got that first win since 2019 in the Six Nations, which is nuts. They can, you know, go go all out for this week, and then they'll want to re reevaluate ahead of the Calcutta Cup. And that week, extra week, will help them potentially with if Martin's not back for this week, then certainly he'll be in the mix for Scotland, as will Ollie Lawrence, and then maybe Marcus Smith was still a little bit uncertain on that one. Positive start then for England. Let's have a little break and then look at the rest of the games from the opening weekend. Okay, we kicked off on Friday night in Marseille with, um, I would say, a bit of a surprise, but that's not to to take anything away from Ireland. They were just exceptional. I just don't think we expected the margin of victory to be 21 points. That was extraordinary. Charles, was it a case of... Ireland being brilliant and France being bad or a bit of a combination how do you sort of feel about it a couple of days later I think it was a sort of a sort of catastrophic occurrence of lots of tiny little things um, that sort of built up into that scoreline being completely frank I I wasn't Ireland were good Ireland were good but I wasn't quite as bowled over by them as other people were um, which is scary in a way, and and, I, and and this is not to take anything away from them. It's scary because I think they've got more gears to go through. Um, I thought France in that second half, admittedly down to fourteen men, but they were really poor. And on the stroke of half time, they were poor. I do think the red card has maybe made more of a difference than people have maybe given it, sort of given credit for because they were, that is in a, that was in a position where they were weak anyway. They're missing their two starting locks. Um, Paul Valemsa was only really sort of fourth choice. They've drafted a 19-year-old, albeit a behemoth 19-year-old. They've drafted a 19-year-old onto the bench. Um, and when Paul Valemsa was was red-carded, as, as he was the second time because it was upgraded, the line-out w- went a bit to pot. And it, But they were still in the hunt. You know, at 24-17, I was chatting, turning to colleagues in the press box, and we were sort of saying... There's still a game. There's still a game on here. A real, real game. It didn't feel like Ireland were away until that um, first driving more try it was Sheehan who scored the, the first one, wasn't it? It was, um, and that was when you sort of felt, okay, it's done now. But France had chances, and just when Peter Omani had been yellow carded um, and uh, France scored, you thought, hang on, there, there could be there could be a, a real comeback on the cards here. And then there was a fabulous defensive read by James Lowe on on, on Ramos, where he sort of let sh- almost showed Dante the inside, and Dante should have took it, but he passed behind to Ramos, and Lowe flew up, held him up, more turnover, and that that. At that point, you sort of felt like France, the, the momentum had shifted and that was France, France's goose cooked, really. Such an interesting game for James Lowe, who were used to sort of dazzling us from an attacking standpoint. But you mentioned that bit of defence and also just how important his left boot was in the kicking game, Charlie. Especially it felt like in the in the early exchanges where France just couldn't get any territory and Lowe's, Lowe's kind of left boot and, and Gibson Park's box kicks were absolutely vital to sort of pinning France back and frustrating them. The kicking game was fascinating from the very start and I don't know whether it was a combination of factors i.e. France's new halfbacks or being or them being seduced by the home crowd or their them just wanting to shift how they were playing but I thought they went away from what has been a fundamental part of their success and Dupont's it's not underrated because we talk about it loads but Dupont's kicking um, Luku absolutely smashed his first clearance up to halfway, but thereafter Ireland really exerted a lot of pressure on the ruck and made it messy for him. And France France just fell away in those kicking ex- exchanges. They tried to catch. There was a really interesting passage where they, Ireland got a little bit lucky. France tried to catch low over chasing. They went. They had a line out and went wide, and then Ramos, I think it was, kicked back over Lowe's head. But Lowe saw it coming, readjusted, caught it, and then won the kicking exchanges with one that you remember it bubbled into the dead ball area and stayed still. Um, and Ireland won that won that kicking exchange by by you know, comfortably by sort of forty odd meters, and they continued to do that throughout the game. And, the, and I think France ended up kicking twenty times in in the game as a whole, which is which would be a lot lower than what they what they will have averaged last year. Um, that will be there'll be a lot of reasons for that. The fact that they went behind early and, and were down to it's fourteen and they were chasing it anyway. But still, it's really interesting, and maybe they're going through some growing pains of their own. And Lowe's booming left boot sort of um, exacerbated them. Did, did we see Charles the 
the sort of effect of France betting in a new attack coach and kind of how that might actually mean that they they need a couple of games to actually get going. I know we, we've spoken about that with England, so it's only fair to say that France as well might need just a little bit of time to bed in with that system. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I think their, their shape, their attacking shape struggled, but also on, on top of that, there were just... I mean, I'm not really sure how much of a sort of a difference an attack coach is going to have on just fundamental basic errors. That I, and you can obviously coach the, the 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 rudimentary skills of the game. Of course, you can. But these were sort of world class players who were, you know, last season you would never have imagined uh, Dante and Fiku making sort of basic errors in both attack and defence, and yet they had crept in. And, and there is an element of chasing the game. There is a um, you know, the, the, clearly the red card had an impact, but it, it did feel a bit more pre-Galtier France. It really did have that sort of air about it of just, you know, that you don't know which French team was gonna, is going to turn up. That old cliche that we thought had been dead and buried. Well, now it, it, it's sort of back that way. And, and no matter what happens at Murrayfield until the following week, you're still going to be able to say that because either they're going to be a bit, you know, a bit mediocre again and Scotland are going to win or I think they're probably going to go and absolutely blast Scotland off the park. It's one or the other, but it's that fickle, that sort of volatility of of, of historical France that Galtier had worked so hard to vanquish and neutral, neutralise. That's rearing its head again. I love that you're saying this a whole week after we got a question about that and you batted it away. Like you were swatting it for six in Hyderabad over no. the fence and now and now it's back. It's back. It's a, it's a no. real it's a real question again. Um a rare one and a half cards for Paul Willem said you touched on it earlier and the and the contrast between France's depth at lock being tested and what happened with him getting those two kind of yellow cards in the first half hour with, with Joe McCarthy for Ireland who was the form selection at lock James Ryan was left on the bench and so you had McCarthy and Ty Byrne um, Charlie just a word on on how well McCarthy played he was uh, he was ripping up trees wasn't he everything he seemed to carry was was with wonderful intent and he was he was superb yeah that looks like the only, just about the only one of my predictions that's going to hold sway at the end of the tournament the fact that he look, he looks like the breakthrough player doesn't he he was breakthrough statement performance everything he was just he was just monstrous his, not just his carrying what I was also I was watching this next to um, in a restaurant actually with a big screen next to our colleague Gav Mares, and it was every time, every time he'd just p- either either pop out of the defensive line and, and pick someone up. Quite literally, there was one on Fran- Francois Cross where Cross seemed to have won the original the, the collision initially, and McCarthy basically hauled him back two or three meters, or he'd smash into counter rucks and and make you know make poor Maxime Luku's life absolute absolute hell. But he was that was a deserved man of the match, even though he came. He came off to, towards the end, didn't he? And, and Ty Byrne, his his lot partner, was phenomenal too. There were loads of loads of excellent performances around that island pack. I thought McCarthy was the standout, and he's just a bit different. Like they, those um, those heavy tight head locks are no wonder they're kind of earning the big bucks around the world. They they are seriously valuable. And we can't finish talking about Ireland without a word on Jack Crowley and just kind of how assured he. He looked. I wondered, Charles, just from watching it in the stands, whether you felt that he looked as good as he did because of the quality system around him, and it and it helps when you've got Bundyaki, just exceptionally high quality centre, cutting through over the gain line and, and making ground, and, and a scrum half in Gibson Park who can box kick it very far and, and has that kind of control. But but equally, Crowley was impressive in his own right, wasn't he? Oh, absolutely. I mean that. Yeah, you're you're totally right. I mean, it's it's certainly helped by the fact that Ireland are so fluid and and harmonious in, in in terms of their attack. So, we wondered how a new fly half would step up in that regard. And actually, of all the teams in the world, Ireland's probably the one where, as a as a as a new fledgling fly half, you'd probably quite like to come in because your pack's good. You're gonna you know you're gonna be behind a solid. Pack, you might not get an armchair ride because the, you know, you know the, the, there are other very, very good packs in the world, but you know you're going to be behind a solid pack and you know that in terms of attacking, everyone's on the same wavelength and you've just got to slot into that. Um, first 15 minutes, however, you were sort of wondering if he was the man because there were a couple of errors. There was a charge down kick. There was the missed shot goal. Uh, I think there was another kick as well that went dead. 
um, and you were wondering, oh, the, he looks nervy. He looks he looks anxious. And I remember he was at 10 for Munster in that match that we've mentioned lots about fly halves when Northampton went over there and won and Finn Smith was outstanding. And he, he was similar there. He looked, a, he was a bit panicky and then he just settled down and he just played beautifully. And that, that pass for the tied burn try, I think that was the settler, the, the proper, proper settler for him where he he basically met, you know, he'd made France look incredibly foolish um, on their own patch. This was pre the Willemse one and a half card, um, pre the Willemse dismissal, if you like. Um, and from there on, he just accelerated and he grew into it beautifully, he matured into the game. And by the end of it, it was a case of Johnny Who. Some brilliant goal kicking as well. He, he drained a couple yeah. of touchline conversions, which weren't weren't easy. And and it's funny, wasn't he it? Missed, he missed the easy one. Yeah, he did. Yeah, the straightforward one at the start, where yeah. you were convinced he'd get it, and then he, he didn't get that. But he he got some very difficult kicks from out wide. It was odd, wasn't it? It almost felt like he was. It was his debut, even though obviously he's got he had nine test caps before. Then it just felt because of the, I guess Charlie, just because of the focus on him and how much expectation there is for him to to fill Sexton's boots and there were some very very funny very dry tweets going around from Irish fans on social media saying like oh maybe it was Sexton who was holding us back all along which I thought was quite funny yeah I mean I, I was so I was more impressed actually for him pushing through those tough those tough moments that that Charles mentioned his ball for Burns try was really nice and we said last week didn't we there's a bit of swagger about him and he kind of had to call upon that because I actually actually listened to the guys at the 42s um sort of on the whistle podcast and um they said that uh, it's almost a case for him of pulling that natural swagger back and almost almost playing within himself rather than sort of um than going over the top of anything um yeah i was i was i was really impressed and, and more so for um the strength of mind he had and just to put the absolute curse on arlen now uh grand slam again someone's gonna have to play really well to stop them aren't they it looks like it's gonna be over to england you know, England are going to have to try and stop them because, I mean, okay, Scotland might be unbeaten. There's a chance that Scotland will be unbeaten when they go to Dublin, but we know Scotland do not enjoy playing Ireland, and this could be Ireland going for a Grand Slam at home. So you'd, it'd be a very, very brave man to put any kind of money on on the Scots there, but you know, oh, we'll just, see. just imagine if we get Scotland going for a Slam in Dublin on the Paddy's Day weekend. That would be fantastic, wouldn't it? I'd be all for it. I'd be all for it. Although I can see why you might not be trusting Scotland after what happened in Cardiff on Saturday, where uh, for 50 minutes, they were absolutely brilliant. Again, again, one of those where you wonder, were Scotland brilliant or were Wales utterly abysmal? And, and probably, maybe actually in hindsight, I'd lean slightly towards Wales being completely abysmal, given that Warren Gatlin came out afterwards and spoke to S4C and actually apologised for the first half performance and said it was one of the worst that he's ever had in his coaching career. I, th- I think if that happens, then then that kind of skews the balance a bit more to towards Scotland being terrible. But having said that, to, to Wales being terrible, but having said that, Scotland, their precision of their kicking game with Finn Russell, the way they dominated all the breakdowns, the way that Wales' attack just had nothing because the Scottish kind of defence was forcing turnovers or slowing down ruck ball. Gatlin talked about Wales going into safety mode, which by that he essentially mean they'd go through three phases, get nowhere, hoof a hopeless kick up field, which Scotland would then counter-attack from. I, I was really, really impressed with Scotland and writing a, this, this very praise-heavy piece about how they'd finally sort of shaken off this tag of being chokers and how impressive was this performance and then Wales started coming back and it all went to uh, it went to chaos and then Willem Dafoe appeared on the big screen it was an extraordinary second half I, I don't know I don't know how much either of you managed to actually see of it Charles you, you might have seen more it, it's funny momentum's a fascinating thing isn't it and and when Wales was sort of getting two tries and then three tries it did feel as though they they were going to win didn't it just the way the second half was panning out yeah, and I mean, as I say, it almost still feels like they did, <laughs> and yet they didn't. Um, but I mean, what was the atmosphere? I mean, I've spoken to people who were there, and they said that the atmosphere was absolutely sensational in the Principality Stadium um, in during that second half, the best that they've experienced for a number of years. Would, yeah, would you, I'd, would you I'd, go with that? I'd go with it. I'd go with it. Having having covered quite a few games there, absolutely 
deafening. It got to the point where it was it was deafening when the tries were scored, but every kind of catch made by Aaron Wainwright when he then set off on a run and, and would beat defenders, it, you thought a try had been scored. It was so loud. It, it, yeah, I mean, I'm I have always thought that it is the best rugby venue, particularly with the roof closed and and days days like that do reinforce it and and maybe it was because of that that noise and momentum that you felt Wales were going to do it so I know Scotland nearly blew the biggest lead in Six Nations history I think it was going to be the biggest comeback credit to them for kind of regathering themselves in the final 10 minutes the two yellow cards throughout the second half admittedly didn't help and they and they lost momentum massively in those stages but I I I think psychologically to have not and it's not just about winning in Cardiff for the first time in 22 years I think actually just to win that game given it was about to fall through their fingers that impressed me but, and I know it, that sounds odd given they were in such a position of strength but if they can take the lessons from that iron out a few things Charlie I don't know I, I wonder if actually this might be a team that we can start taking a bit more seriously and I think that would be great for the championship it was it was wild though, wasn't it? Like, yeah. It was absolutely wild. I know we we sort of went. We were talking about how Scotland we know kind of want to do three things in this championships. One is be more disruptive and aggressive with their defence. Two is be more adaptable with their attack, and they also want to be able to seize control of moments and not let them slide. Um, but that was a pretty poor start on that on that front, wasn't it? Um, it reminded me, it was the reverse of the mad Calcutta Cup game in 2019 um, when it was Scotland making that amazing comeback um, and then going ahead and then and then Ben Teo going under the post and, and it being a draw. But um, yeah, there'll be frustration and there'll be, uh, in, in a way, they're almost back to square one whereby they know that they've got the, the talent to cut teams apart and almost toy with teams and they they can look like a really balanced side equally they can they can totally capitulate and um i don't know how much history was wearing heavy on on them but um what's interesting is that they have now ticked off another sort of um i guess burden for them and over the last couple of years they've ticked off a few burdens against uh, france you know beating them beating them twice and they have traditionally sort of matched up quite nicely against against France and it but last year in Paris it was a another patch albeit at the beginning of the game and um, when they went 19 nil down I think that that kind of stopped them um stopped them in their tracks and gave them a mountain to climb so yeah fascinating I, I wouldn't I don't know I, I, I don't I feel like I'm back to square one having looked as you say Ben really high on them and then just seeing that they're still it's quite jarring that they're still capable of something like that and they and they we should me- mention the penalty count they were Ben O'Keefe just hated them for a bit didn't he? the was, penalty yeah. count's absolutely hilarious so yeah. so it finished 16-4 I think and and Scotland at one point had conceded 14 penalties in a row that's yeah. got to be yeah. close to a record Charles yeah. I'm guessing Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, what what are we at now? We're at, we, you never know which Scotland are going to turn up. Is that's what, almost what almost what we're at now? Um, but I think yeah, a, a crazy crazy game with a very underwhelming sort of finish and a very mm. uh, you know anticlimactic ending. Um, and I think if we're being killjoys, which you know we, we we try not to be, but I think if we're being really sort of realistic, Scotland really should have won that game by a little bit more and that try at the end, I mean, they were stopped by it. Do have Van der Merwe put the ball on an ankle rather than the line yeah. and they did actually score at the end and that that would have been the, the you know, that would have been a bonus point for them that might might prove critical and um, so it, it, they did well to, to get over the finish line in the end but I think that sort of try at the end, the sort of almost clumsiness of it summed up their summed up their evening part of me wondered if they were just relieved to be in the area of the field where they were because they got they got a penalty advantage i think from the scrum or breakdown i can't remember what it was and almost it was the fact that they were just short of wales line there was there was kind of widespread relief that they knew they probably weren't going to lose it from there um finn russell was really interesting afterwards he had some quotes uh, to the bbc which i'm just going to read he was scotland captain in that game and he sort of he said the frustrating thing is the points that I was making to his teammates just weren't being listened to. I told them to leave the ruck and they still kept going in at the ruck and we get a yellow card for going in too many times and for offside. So it was almost even kind of being like quite uniquely for a captain and essentially a new captain because it's only his second game as captain after one warm-up last summer and now he's a he's a co-captain alongside Rory Darge. I found it quite interesting how he was saying 
you know like pay attention to me like i need to be listened to i'm I'm trying to i'm trying to help you here we, we also had a little clip of him afterwards because he had a very good goal kicking performance and that ended up being quite pivotal for the final score he spoke afterwards about how he found it quite easy uh playing inside under the roof yeah, we're indoors, so it's nice and easy. Um, <laughs> need to have a chat with the guys at SIU and get get a roof over there. Um, now nah, my kicking was good. I've been feeling good the last week, so um, that was pleasing for me to, to hit, I think it was five from five or, or something like that, which I suppose effectively proved the point in the end. But um, yes, yeah, I think personally for me that was nice. Um, but the boys scored two tries under the post, which makes it a little bit easier as well. Something tells me the Scottish Rugby Union are not going to be investing in a roof anytime soon for Murrayfield but it's a nice it's a nice idea isn't it I just wondered whether just thinking ahead about Scotland France Charles you, you've talked about not knowing which France are going to turn up and not knowing which Scotland are going to turn up so if I forced you to give me an answer about who was going to win given that Scotland are going to be at home and and France looked a bit out of sorts in Marseille which way would you lean oh um, I think I'm going to lean with French backlash that might be heart overhead slightly but I'm gonna go French backlash France to win at Murrayfield and I'm, I don't I, I, I can't see it being perfect from them but I think they will have enough I think they will have enough and I I can't you can't see the sort of things that were happening in the second half um, last weekend happening on mass so sort of dramatically Again, I don't I, think. I mean, or, or can you? Can you? You might be able well, to. I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of talking. I'm talking myself out of it, even as I'm speaking. Uh. I mean, my top tip for France would be to maul everything if they can, because Scotland's maul defence, Gregor Townsend noted afterwards, has actually been a strength of theirs in um, in recent years. But completely went to pot in Cardiff. They just didn't have an answer, and to concede three three driving maul tries will really frustrate them in the week. And so, Charlie, is that an obvious area for France to kind of target them? I guess. It is, but they've got they'll have type five injuries of uh, injuries and, and unavailability of their own right. France with with Valenza likely to miss Valenza. The Valenza thing was so disappointing because he's been so pivotal um, to them. So will will two laggy start, Charles? Uh, yeah, I was wondering this. Is he fit enough? I, I don't think he is. I don't think he's fit enough to go beyond. I, I think the plan all along would have been to unleash him off the bench for the last maybe 10 minutes, five minutes in different circumstances. Obviously, the way that the game panned out meant that they felt that they needed a bit more dynamism and a bit more sort of of an impact earlier on. I I was wondering what they would do here because then if you start Wokey and Gabriag together, you're quite lightweight there. Admittedly, they're both excellent players, but the line-out struggled, so there might be a temptation to bring Wokey in. Um, but saying that, you know, their entire back row are are line-out forwards, so it it shouldn't be struggling, really. Um... They might be tempted to bring Swangy in. I don't think Mayafu's fit um, for this weekend. I think he's missing the first two games. The, 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 there might be a temptation, but I'm, I'm not sure he's. I'm not sure he's there yet, whereby he could be starting a test in the Six Nations. But he would cause some damage. He would really cause some damage if he did start. Um, it's just more, and it, it, it was his jackling. I was impressed by his jackling. It was more that towards the end of the game, the ball was going into touch, and he was absolutely miles away from it. And you could see, being in the stadium, him having to jog basically the entire width of the pitch to get to this line out. Um, let's just say he wasn't necessarily hurrying. And and against Scotland, who are gonna. You know, spread you spread you from edge to edge. That that's right. potentially pretty pretty problematic. Um, I couldn't call it at all. I think for the uh, sounds really sanctimonious, doesn't it? But for the good of the tournament, at, at Scotland win and Scotland getting on a got a, getting on a roll so that they can both the, both them and Ireland can be unbeaten on that final weekend would be delicious, wouldn't it? Yeah, I was just having a quick scan of Tuilagi's minutes for Perpignan, and they're all over the shop. Actually, this season he kind of he's sort of has spurts of fifty or forty or thirty, and he's done eighty minutes twice all season. So I think, and Tess Roby's obviously significantly a step up as well. So that might be a bit of an ask for him. Like you say, Charlie, I'm I'm kind of siding with you. I, I love this idea of Scotland going to Dublin at the end and, and having all that momentum. And if you beat France, then what is it? You've got to face England, kind of a you know a Wales who are. I oh, know faced Wales already. Got to face England and then Italy and Rome. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it could happen. I'm, I'm not ruling it out at all. Just before we get to your questions, we wanted to comment on the death of Barry John on on Sunday, which was announced 
And that Sunday afternoon, very sad. And another great of Welsh rugby, known as the King. And when you when you get that nickname, then that's always pretty special. Um, Charlie, I know, I know with a lot of sort of Welsh ancestry, it's part of your family. He he was one of the greats, wasn't he? And and he will be certainly missed. Yeah, absolutely. One of my one of my father's uh, favourite players, slightly even, slight even for the amateur era, but just a ghosting, gliding playmaker who um, seemed to bend games to to his will. And it was really interesting, sort of writing up the news story last night, um, just reading some of the tributes, sort of at the time that his peers would get, uh, would give him. So Gareth Edwards um hear the famous sort of exchange um you part you pass it i'll catch it which is what barry john said to said to gareth edwards when they first met but gareth edwards later wrote that he had a cool superiority which spread to others in the side remarkable a remarkable marvelous easiness in the mind reducing problems to the simplest form backing his own talent all the time i just thought that was that was really cool and actually watching you know, it's very limited footage and very grainy footage that we see of those games in the late sixties and, and seventies, but that comes that comes across, doesn't it? Yeah, those those sort of legends, that that golden era, that Welsh golden era, they're sort of leaving us one by one, aren't they? It's um, it's all quite sad. Yeah, Barry John, the Red Phantom, Bill McLaren used to call him um, rugby's first superstar, and then you know he was he he became that sort of icon of of rugby and the you know it, it transcended the sport and then obviously turned it back on its turned his back on it all um and yeah i mean it just in terms of it, our coverage of it it's difficult for us i suppose to add anything above and beyond what serene mcgeekin has, has, has written obviously serene mcgeekin um played in in that era and his tribute just like his jpr williams um tribute is is, is very touching and um i didn't sort of encourage all all listeners to to try and scout it out and give it a read Charlie, I think you, you used the word gliding to sum him up, and that's perfect from watching the coverage. He, he had fantastic kind of footwork and, and running lines, and, and was you can see why he was so popular after that after that tour to New Zealand, and also why I think the story around him retiring at twenty seven is fascinating about how he sort of turned his back on the on the limelight and the media of it all, and his line about describing Wales as a bit of a goldfish bowl is one that has been used often by players and, and coaches sort of moving forward, but. A fantastic legacy, a player who I know is revered by many and who will be deeply missed. Okay, let's have some of your questions. Thank you for sending in so many when we sent them out on Sunday. Plenty to get through and we'll we'll try and go over a few things we haven't covered so far. Just starting with a question from Andrew who says, kind of apart from Ireland, is there really a lot separating the rest of the teams And, and could it could be very competitive from positions two to six. Charles, what do you make of that? It, it does feel as though, based on Friday night alone, that they they are a little bit ahead of the rest, Ireland. Yeah, and, and and the competitiveness of positions two to six is certainly a, a narrative that has been built this weekend with how narrow the scorelines were both in Rome and in Cardiff. Before quite going down that road, I would like to see another round of fixtures just because there is the chance that England could beat Wales quite comfortably. There's also the chance that France could beat Scotland quite comfortably. And then you're sort of, you know, and you know, Ireland have probably got a loss in them at some point, maybe if it's not this tournament um, at some point. And then you might be looking at sort of a closing of the gap to Ireland from what we from what we thought on the first, first weekend and the opening weekend, where yes, they are they clearly look like the outstanding team in the championship and the outstanding candidates for a Grand Slam and, and for a championship title. But I think a few of the other teams are going to have a little bit... Oh, they're going to have something to say about that, let's say. And, I mean, is there a chance that that second half from Wales flatters, has flattered them a little bit? We, we won't know until this weekend. I think they're a, a true test of what the true Wales is of those sort of two completely polar opposite halves will come at Twickenham this weekend. It's an interesting kind of subplot to that question, isn't it? Because we've, we've almost written England and Wales off it, in advance because it just seems like there's too many new new faces, um, too many new systems, or too many new systems being bedded in and therefore can you turn it all around in time to win? But I, I don't know. The more the more I wonder about them, if they can get a couple of wins and be be in a position, if one of them can be in a position but where they've got a couple of wins by round three or four, it, it, maybe not for Wales, certainly for England. I'm, I'm intrigued, put it that way. Um, 
The question we had from Jared was, is Wainwright potentially the best number eight in the Six Nations, if not the best? I think, I mean, immediately... I don't. He was very good in the in the second half, particularly. Like he he carried like a bolting horse. I think I put in my match report because he he just seemed to make so much ground. But when you consider the the candidates for number eight with Caelan Doris and Gregory Aldrich and what Ben has done for England, Charlie would he be? Would Wayne Wright be second best? I'm I'm not so sure personally. I say this as someone that really really rates Aaron Wayne Wright. I remember there was a moment. Um, he took the ball in the backfield. I think it was like a bobbling ball. Looked up again in a game against the All Blacks. Saw Rico Ioane and burned Rico Ioane. And he, he's just a he's just a phenomenal athlete, great player. Um, so I say that say this with that in mind. I think Kalen Doris and, and Gregory Algie, I think there's daylight behind those two. Um, then I think he'd be in a, in a mix of players. I really rate Mac Ferguson as well and Lorenzo Canoni's good player. He's one of Italy's best, along with um, Manancello at the weekend. Um, and then we haven't, we sort of haven't um, mentioned Ben Earl at all, who was England's best player at the World Cup. So I'd say, how about diplomatically, we say that he's he's part of a chasing pack behind Doris and Aldry, who are the probably the class acts. It's a crowded field. That's very polite. That's my, that's my politician's answer. That's very crowded polite. field of bolting horses. <laughs> bolting horses. Well, the only thing that. I would say about wait about Wainwright. Also, it's very hard to say Aaron Wainwright five times in a row, I've just realised. Yeah. Um, is that kind of under Gatland, he was a favourite, and then under Pivak, he sort of went to the fringes of um, selection because he wasn't what he was looking for. And then as soon as Gatland returned last year, he, he was straight back in and he's been kind of an ever-present ever since. He's clearly someone that Warren really rates highly for what he offers in terms of athleticism with improving physicality but yeah like Charles says it's a busy group um question from Paul Tate is do Italy finally have the right coach now I mean it's it's one game in a cycle and I think we were huge fans of um Kieran Crowley during his time there and what he managed to achieve and also his subsequent um input input on the Netflix series Charles seems to have gone down quite well given his uh his honesty but what do you reckon is Casada potentially you know, a good step forward. Uh, y- yes, but I-, I don't think Crowley had done much wrong. In in all honesty, I think he I- I- the World Cup was a bit of a disaster for them. That's it, but, isn't it? I think it's the yeah. way the defence just imploded at the World Cup and yeah. shipping ninety six points to the All Blacks. But I mean, he was he, the, the the announcement around him his departure. Um, you know, surprised him, and he didn't want to go. And you don't that happened pre World Cup, and you don't know what sort of an effect that had. But I think he brought them on a lot, and really, it's Casada's job to sort of build on that on really good foundations. They they have they have a really sort of lethal set of, of attacking rugby players in their starting fifteen. The depth is where they struggle, um, but then it, it's just all about set piece and defence and the nuts and bolts of Italy's game is where the improvements are needed. Is Casada that man? I mean, he's got great top fourteen experience. Um, in France with both Racing and Stad. Um, it, it's just difficult to judge after one game, being honest. Um, you hope that he's the right man. You hope that they've got the right coach. The signs are, you'd, you'd be, you're optimistic that it's the case, but we'll have to see how they go over the next four matches. I, re- I really like that question, because, but I, and I think, and I totally agree with everything Charles has said there. Um, I think you've just got to think about the succession, really, and what Crowley has given them. It is something that's, can be their kind of USP as a side and now it'll be up to Casada to sort of as, as again as Charles said solidify the foundations that that um, USP can can work with work from even yeah I think that's all very fair uh, we had a question from William Fisher asking was William Defoe at the Principality part of a fever dream I mean it was certainly my favourite moment I just wondered if um, if we're thinking about England Wales and Scotland France who's going to pop up on the big screen that's going to make you do a double take and think, is that really who I think it is on the big screen? I'm thinking like Tom Cruise at Twickenham, for example, might be one where that might throw you off your game a little bit. Are there any that spring to mind that would would catch you by surprise? <laughs> um, Margot Robbie? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's, she used to be a Clapham resident, so I don't think that's that's certainly out of the question. She knows, knows There'll be a few London Clapham well. residents at Twickenham, you'd imagine. That's true, that's true. Charles, anybody? Anybody at Murrayfield who you might think, blimey, what are you doing there? No, no, not after Willem Dafoe. Is there anybody, well, just, no. 
No, c- c- is that going to be beaten? Because he's a he's a Hollywood a lister, but also quite rogue and niche. So, is there anybody like? Yeah, no, he's in a very sort of niche of his own in that regard. No, I can't. I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. Final question about from James Chandler about what makes the perfect breakfast. Did you do a video of your breakfast at your hotel? Like you promised. I did. Your yeah. Twitter followers. It was, it was- it was it was for uh, it was for my wife, but it ended up being yeah for 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 a lot more people. I think yeah. Um, the answer to that question is cake. When you're on the in continental Europe, and when you're home, it's black pudding. Ooh. I can't disagree with black pudding, but I think eggs have always got to be somewhere in the in 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 the, in the melting pot. You sent us a video of some gelato, but I wasn't sure about what time of day that was. Whether that was post game or pre game, or is that just all times of day for your prep? It's all, it's all times ago. That that particular video was post post game. Yeah, my walk back to the hotel to watch the game back like a true pro. Okay, that's it for today, uh, guys. Where are you going to be this week, Charlie? Where are you going to be? Going to be twi- twicking them all at the weekend and cutting back and forth from Penny Hill Park. By the sounds of it, over the week. Have you missed Penny Hill and its leafy surroundings and its good spread of uh, of refreshments for journalists? Yeah, absolutely. Refreshments for journalists always. <laughs> Charles, where are you going to be? I am following Wales this week in 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 Twickenham, flying to Cardiff, and then I'm at England Wales at Twickenham also on Saturday. Lovely. I will be at Murrayfield for Scotland against France. The uh, the who will which version of which team will turn up game as Charles has built it. Very excited to see who does. Thank you to Charlie. Thank you to Charles. Thanks to you for downloading the podcast. If you're new, welcome along. If you're an existing person who's passed it on to your friends and family, thank you very much for doing that as well. Don't miss out on all our coverage on the Six Nations. There's loads coming out over the next few days and plenty more as we build up to another exciting weekend. But that is all for this week. So enjoy the games. We'll catch you next week. Goodbye.